climate change is likely to impact uh, food production systems and specifically agriculture in fairly significant ways. Uh, that's what recent science is beginning to show us. The negative impacts are likely to translate into reduced yields of ma many of our major food crops, uh, reduced livestock productivity, uh, reduce uh, fisheries uh, productivity and so changing climate over the next several decades could significantly impact uh, agricultural productivity and therefore food systems and food uh, availability uh, for global populations. Interestingly and it's important to note that there are likely to be some positive outcomes too as, as temperatures go up some regions where crops cannot be grown now especially in northern latitudes might become suitable for these crops. Uh, we don't know uh, exactly what the total impact will be, but uh, I know there may be increases in productivity on the one hand, and at the same, on the other hand, we might start to see new pests and diseases also in these regions. So the net effect is still difficult to predict. It comes to mind uh, in 2010 uh, when uh, Mexico experienced a very, very severe drought. Uh, it was so severe, it was almost 2.5 million people and 40% of Mexico was impacted by that drought. Uh, the drought uh, caused major damage to, to local crops and, and livestock. Uh, a lot of livestock died. Uh, people had to scramble to find alternative forms of livelihoods. The Mexican government had to sort of uh, come in very strongly, spent uh, several hundred million dollars, over a billion pesos to ensure that uh, their communities and people had adequate food, access to food and water. Exports from Mexico uh, were impacted. Uh, the cattle that normally come into the U.S. Uh, were no longer available because these cattle had died. Uh, and so it was a, a rather strong impact that could take decades uh, to recover from. It does require careful thought as to how we might begin to prepare ourselves and make our, our livelihoods and landscapes more resilient. Recently, the World Bank, uh, in collaboration with the, with the Potsdam Institute uh, in, in Germany, completed a, a study on the projections of climate change and the projected impact on agriculture and food systems uh, in, in three major regions, Africa, South Asia, and East Asia and the Pacific. Um, uh, uh, studies are ongoing to look at uh, other regions, such as Latin America, East, uh, East and Central Asia, and, and uh, Middle East. In Africa, the study projected that uh, we would get an increase in, in sort of aridity, in dryness, in droughts, and uh, up to 40% of the current cropland that's used for corn production might become less suitable for corn production. Now, this is worrying because corn is a major food crop uh, for people in Africa. In addition, uh, the study showed that some parts of Africa, the eastern part mainly, might become wetter. And although it, in the first instance it might seem a good outcome, uh, some of those landscapes aren't able to hold that much water when it comes in. So if you were suddenly to get an increase in rainfall, uh, then those landscapes might uh, actually show more floods or might experience greater flooding uh, unless uh, communities and governments start to prepare for them. So you see that uh, even within the continent, you've got uh, differential or changing in variable impact patterns. Uh, a third finding for Africa was that um, because of the dryness and, and increasing heat, uh, as has also been projected from the studies, we might get um, negative impacts on the grasslands that sustain many of the livestock systems of Africa. Uh, and so if those grasslands were not able to sustain the, the kinds of livestock uh, and the communities that depend on those livestock uh, now, uh, it might cause migration either to urban areas or other areas in the continent. And so uh, this uh, causes problems because then you get disruptions of, of local uh, infrastructure. You get problems uh, with inadequate services to communities and migrating people, uh, as we're beginning to see in some of the uh, uh, migrations related to sort of more extreme uh, events in, in related to security, related to local conflict, etc. So for Africa, uh, it's important to think clearly now what would be the uh, opportunities for governments and, and others to begin to invest in, whether it's new varieties, whether it's new uh, irrigation systems uh, properly designed, 
whether it's uh, special protection for sloping lands which might receive more water, more rainfall. Uh, so there are, for each of these challenges, there are opportunities. So I think that's the, the, the silver lining here is that we need to begin to think of what these opportunities are and do it soon. Uh, in South Asia, the, the studies project a, a significant change maybe in the patterns of rainfall uh, associated with the monsoon rains. These are the, the, uh, the winds that bring rainfall to South Asia. Uh, they're very, very important because uh, much of the agriculture of South Asia is dependent on the monsoons. Uh, and the studies project that you might get both uh, an increase in the intensity of the monsoons as well as uh, so there would be a rainfall coming in greater amounts in shorter shorter periods as well as possibly shifts in where that rainfall comes uh, not falling in the places that it has fallen over many many centuries and so that causes problems because people aren't expecting those large shifts in India for example uh, there may not be enough water for irrigation uh, and so agricultural productivity would be impacted. In certain parts of the continent near Bangladesh there may be excess rainfall coming down and so that would mean water coming down the hills uh, in addition to sea level rise and that would be also a problem because uh, for example the government of Bangladesh is, is making huge efforts to sort of uh, prepare its communities for sea level rise and then all of a sudden you find water coming in through the back door as it were and so you have to battle both fronts. So these are kinds of issues that we're beginning to project uh, for, for South Asia. Uh, East Asia and, uh, and the Pacific Islands uh, will not go unscathed either and we're seeing the, an increased likelihood of, uh, of uh, more intense uh, cyclones and we've just heard of a very devastating cyclone that st struck the Philippines you know, thousands of people killed, uh, huge infrastructure, da infrastructure damage that could be you know, 20, 30 billion dollars worth to, to recover from. Uh, so we can see rather huge impacts and if there's going to be more such events in the future, then we can see how that might also impact uh, agriculture because it'll impact the landscapes. There'll be more water coming down the, some of those hills and that might impact uh, agriculture in, in quite a significant way. The other impact for East Asia and the Pacific is, is sea level rise and we know now that as sea level comes up you know, and it doesn't have to come up very much, uh, 15 centimeters, 30 centimeters over 2050 and beyond, we might get uh, in combination with a storm surge from a cyclonic event uh, wave heights of as much as three to five meters. A third factor that might impact uh, um, uh, livelihoods related to food systems is, is the sea level rise will impact coral systems uh, together with ocean acidification. The ocean is getting more acid uh, and that means coral systems might be damaged uh, and uh, that will impact the production of fish. The coral systems are very, very important. Uh, they serve as nurseries, if you like, for many, many uh, sea dwelling organisms, especially fish and crustaceans uh, that, that are important in our food uh, systems and if those were to be impacted again that would be quite uh, significant for coastal communities and, and for countries that depend on revenue uh, from those uh, coastal systems. It's important to, to, to emphasize that many of the impacts that we are already seeing and this is for less than a degree Celsius of warming you know, uh, uh, will intensify as we approach two degrees. Uh, two degrees is not going to be a picnic uh, based on some of the events we're seeing now. Uh, and uh, as we approach four degrees Celsius, that's about 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit, then, uh, you know, we really don't know uh, how severe some of the impacts will be because then we begin to get interaction among different impacts. So we get a kind of cascade effect whereby uh, one one factor that's been impacted starts to impact another and so on and so forth. And, and a one uh, interesting example that's being looked at is how forests uh, globally might become impacted by these rising temperatures. And as the health of these forests starts to decline, you might get a dieback of some of these large areas of forests. Uh, the Amazon is one uh, example. And as a result of that, these forests, which normally put out a lot of water, 
in the way they grow and they take up water from the soil and put it out into the atmosphere. Uh, that water then contributes to local rainfall. And because of the heat effect on forests, uh, the, the poor health of forests, you might get less rainfall and that might impact agriculture. And that, that's one small example of a cascade effect uh, that you know, is not easy to predict. And so as we get into a four degree world, uh, then all bets are off as to sort of how severe some of these impacts might happen just because of a snowball effect among different factors. An important uh, approach to, to dealing with climate change uh, is the concept of working with landscape scales, uh, whereby we look at the full range of systems, food production systems as well as natural systems, and, and we try to work with both so that we've got good production in our farm systems and we've got good ecosystem services from our natural systems, our forests, our wetlands, uh, and, uh, and other such areas. And this provides some of the, the resilience we're going to need. In terms of farming, climate smart agriculture is, is, is one way we adapt our cropping systems to be more resilient to climate shocks. Uh, and that uh, really has to be done in the context of not just the field, uh, but from field to watershed to landscape scales that makes our agriculture climate smart, makes it more resilient uh, and makes it more productive in the long term. So ultimately, even though every one of us has to contribute to reducing emissions and to making our livelihoods more resilient, I think the real uh, punch comes from individuals and communities working with their governments and governments empowering their communities to take action, uh, to contribute, to live uh, more sustainably to contribute more food and, and to protect the environment and the landscapes which uh, not only us but our children and grandchildren will depend upon.